And I'll tell you one thing. This is the first study that no one actually quit. So they all stayed in. Yeah, that was remarkable, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, they're tough. I'm just saying. It sounds like yeah. these guys are tough. Vikings. They're Vikings. Right. They're Vikings. Yeah. Vikings, right. Vikings with hip replacements. That's right. right. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Yeah. Which is okay. Yours. We have well, now we're switching it up. We've All just right. done we've done three knee replacements, and I had some uh, had some people from the hip replacement world want to know when we're going to talk about them. So now we got that. All right. All right. So this is uh, Virgis Husby, early maximal strength training in an efficient is an efficient treatment for patients operated with total hip arthroplasty, and this I love it. I love yeah. it. The title. The title is telling us. Tell us what tells us what they found. Like right? right, okay. And this is from the Archives of Physical Medical Rehabilitation, two thousand nine. And this is from Norway. Norway. So they got right to it. Mm -hmm. And we really have here. We have a a randomized controlled uh, study. And <laughs> these guys are pretty tough. Look at here. They. Uh, at 24 patients, another big one, but 24 <laughs> patients, and they uh, randomized them to strength training, which had leg press and hip abduction exercises, and the other group was conventional rehabilitation, and for the most part, they did this uh, five, five times a week. Now, they strength trained five times a week uh, for four weeks. Pretty okay, badass. That's, yeah. that's right. They, that's what I'm saying. These Norwegians are tough, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they checked their... Uh, their um, their strengths basically at uh, pre-op and then one week post-op and five weeks post-op, and they measured strength, gait pattern, work efficiency, at VO2 max, health-related quality of life, and clinical hip joint function. So they they um, they have a nice thing, and I'll tell you one thing: this is the first study that no one actually quit, so they all stayed in. Yeah, that was remarkable, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, they're tough. I'm just saying. It sounds like I'm yeah. these guys are tough. Vikings. They're Vikings. Right. They're Vikings. Yeah. Right. Vikings with hip replacements. That's right. right. <laughs> Pretty awesome. <laughs> yes. Right. And so um, what they did is they rigged them up, and uh, these guys started doing presses, and they did they were pretty heavy. One-hour training, five days a week, leg press, and uh, hip abduction exercises. And they um, the results... The results are actually pretty good. The, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At one week, there was no difference between the two. But five weeks, there was increased in bilateral leg presses. Um, both groups had greater strength, but the, um, the uh, strength training was, was better. Um, the, abductive strength, uh, the abduction uh, strength training was also uh, better than the conservative. They had no difference in gait, and uh, work efficiency attended, it kind of trended, towards uh, the strength trained group. Mm -hmm. There's no difference in VO2 max and uh, the health quality uh, studies are no difference on that either. And that kind of, um, that kind of goes with most people are pretty happy with hip replacements, you know? And so their interpretation was strength training showed significant increase in performance in leg press, hip abduction strength versus traditional rehab. And I agreed with that. And I thought that um, there may be benefits from uh, continuing long string, long, uh, study strength. Now, the specifics in this case, this this hip replace. This um, had a single guy, single surgeon, who did through a lateral approach. Now, lateral. The hip replacements I did were almost always posterior lateral, occasionally anterior. Lateral hips uh, approach goes directly on the lateral side, and you you literally take off the gluteus medius off the greater trochanter and yeah. superiorly. Yeah. You know, and so, and then you got to put it back. <laughs> and, and then what happens is, you know, it's always that putting it back thing. Because when I was in medical school 100 years ago, it was very common to put troch do trochanteric osteotomies. You'd cut the troch off, move the whole thing, and then wire the thing back. And patients had a lot now, of why, Now, okay, so totally off topic, Fred, but I got yeah. to stop, stop you there. Because uh, it just amazes me that you guys can do that. So, so um, I've actually scrubbed when I was a medical student yeah. and an intern – yeah. Um, uh, when I, and when I was on ortho on a couple of hip replacements and, uh, I, I mean, I was very impressive, indelible members. You, know, you put on the space, you put <laughs> yes, on the freaking yeah. space suit, right? <laughs> and you go, and, 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 and it's cool. These guys are like, like the ultra Tim Allen kind of thing. You guys, <laughs> you guys are awesome, right? With, with the pro trackers and the goniometers and all and, 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 and so you're doing this like, yeah, astronauts with power tools. Cool. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But um, and, 
And if I recall correctly, I saw it done the way that you described, where they basically did a greater trochanteric osteotomy, and then they reaffixed the greater trochanter right. to the proximal femur. Right. So now you're telling me that they basically take the glute off its insertion on the greater trochanter, and then they put it back. Right. You take how it. Do you, how do you do that? What well, do you, you just sew it back onto the bone. Yeah, how do you, how yeah, you, you got to drill. That? You got to drill holes. And the thing is that you take oh. it as a, a single plate of muscle from the vastus lateralis, the anterior third of vastus lateralis, and you you're going right off the trochanter, and you usually make a step and slice back, and you're going full thickness. And you have to take it off. Some you know with a bovi subperiosteally remove it. So that thing. Now you're looking. You get good exposure for the hip this way, but. You know, one of the problems when you have, you know, you abductor weakness after this, that's more commonly seen with this. That's why I'm, it's interesting that they chose this and, <laughs> and, they, and they knew the outcome because obviously they're writing a paper, but they're saying, well, these lateral hips, these people can have abductor weakness and uh, they get limps and everything else. So they're putting that all out there, but they don't get any limps at this case. So this guy knows how to do this operation. Who's doing these laterals. Now, to, but, I'll yeah. clarify one more thing for me. When they're talking about hip abduction, are they, yes. are they talking about, what are they talking about? They're talking about femoral extension or are they talking about external femoral rotation? What are they Outside. talking about? Hip abduction is just, just straight away, hip. straight, straight, straight out. Yep. So using like tensor fascia lata and... Yeah, and, and gluteus medius. And gluteus medius. Yeah, that's it. Which, in other words, using the muscle that they took off. <laughs> which is, it, yeah, but... but <laughs> Held on by two stitches. <laughs> but they took off gluteus, they took gluteus maximus off too, right? Well, splitting that thing is split. Okay. All right. That's that right. split. So, and then, <laughs> but if you're looking at hip abduction, right, yep. just straight femoral abduction of the femur, that's an intrinsically weak movement to begin with. I mean, like even in somebody like me, that's not a terribly strong movement. Well, the thing about it is, it's also if if you want to think about it, we were, the quad muscle is the dominant muscle for knee replacement but the hip abductor is a dominant muscle for hip replacement. Because mm -hmm. remember, the, the, uh, the abductor, the amount, they talk about offset, right? The, the position between the femoral shaft, a line from the femoral shaft, and then a line to the center of rotation of the femoral head. That distance, you, that's one of the things you try to do when, you, when, you're, when you're doing hip replacement. You want to reconstruct that size because that's, that's the tension of the abductor muscle, right? If I make it loose, I made a loose abducting muscle, I'm, I'm, this guy's going to get a limp and have instability. So I got to rebuild the correct offset and the tension of the muscle. So the thing is that classically you do a, a posterior lateral hip replacement. More, it's probably still the most common approach in the United States anyway. You basically, you open up the gluteus max, you split the muscle, and then you're, you're looking at and you just internally rotate the hip, and you, you really are not hurting the gluteus me, medius. You're moving it out of the way, getting to the posterior aspect of the hip, and then you can take the short external rotators off and you expose the hip joint. But this okay. way, you know, this guy, he's taking the whole thing off. And so, so that by itself is a, you know, so, a, so, a, so a, you're, you're, you're kind of impressed that he got good results. Yeah. That, all of them. That, they yeah. all had the same. And then, and they did a pretty good job looking to see <laughs> with um, their gait, gait analysis and their, um, uh, Merle uh, Daubigny uh, Postel score, which is kind of like how do you how do you feel your hip is? Are you limping? No, and they're all good. They're as good as you can really get. And so, at at the um, five week post op, these patients are happy. And that's the thing about hip replacements. Uh, a classic thing I remember: um, you do a hip replacement on somebody, and then they need a knee replacement. They come back to you for that. You say, well, this is a different animal. You're, oh, yeah, no problem. No, this is a different animal. So you do the knee replacement. Then you go see the patient. The guy's looking at you like, what did you do to me? Mm -hmm. I told you, <laughs> it's a different animal. So the hip replacement was a lot of those. Hip replacement was the one major surgery that I remember patients. You know, there's lots of patients, but some would have, like, no pain. You do a hip replacement. You have chisels, hammers, saws, you name it. Where, and you go see them. They're not in any pain. You have to take a lot of pain medicine. I don't take any pain medicine. What? No, oh, I don't have any pain. So that pain that gets them into that operation is very different. So I think that's one of the reasons, that's my take anyway, why at five weeks that I have people who are really strong and people who aren't that strong, but they all think they feel good because that is what they look for, you know? Interesting. Interesting. So, and, then, um, and then, you know, I'm looking at the same thing. I was getting a kick out of these Norwegian, these Viking guys here doing five days a week. So again, and again, another thing I was going to throw out, because as well as in the joint replacements you just talked about, you know, the one thing that they don't mention is, you know, we talk about anabolic effects and catabolic effects. 
knee mm-hmm. replacements and hip replacements are major surgery that cause major systemic catabolic changes. Sure. And what happens is you're, you're as we know, right? If if um if I'm going under the bar and working out, but I'm not sleeping and I'm not eating right, I'm not getting any stronger. And when you take a person and you do a major surgery on them, chances are they don't have the best appetite. Chances are they're not sleeping that well. So all the things that we know are needed for us to get stronger, this is not the most optimal place to get stronger, right? And then when you're doing, and these guys did get stronger, but they were five days a week. So where's that, you know, that, uh, that rest so that you can have a little recovery before you have adaptation, you know? Especially and because if you look at the, unless, tell me, unless I read yep. this wrong, the patients who got the conventional rehab yep. did five days a week. Yeah, three and to just, five. Three to five. But the strength training group got the conventional rehab also. And, yes. And the strength training. So yep. these guys were getting flailed. Every day, five days Every, a week. They yeah, did. yeah. They did. And they um, did, and they had decent weights, too. I mean, they were. <laughs> yeah. it looked like they were good. So yeah. that's what I'm saying. Don't mess with these guys. They have it all listed. So, in fact, yeah. so let's let's some so what's your takeaway from this paper i mean it's not a, oh. it's not a perfect paper it's kind of a small study all right well yeah uh, you know, all there, that i think situations. that strength training works i think it works for this i think that um not you only think, that but you think jacobson at all were kind of green with envy when they saw it yeah, i think they were but uh, i can tell you right now hip replacements and knee replacements the patients are different they just an animal right different like you said this is so i think that's what it is but i think they could they could learn a little bit more too. I mean, if, if these guys are getting that good getting five days a week, imagine how the good they'd get getting two or three days a week. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, and, the, and, and then uh, a, a little bit off the topic of this paper. Right. So um, I, I, I thought it was an important, uh, an, an important addition to the literature on this topic. Uh, I don't remember if, uh, if Patrizio got this and captured this in his review or not, but the question I want to ask you is this, you, are strength training. You lift weights, yeah. right? So you squat and deadlift and, and do presses and all of that and very well. Um, let's say that you needed a hip replacement and you had no intention of discontinuing barbell training. Right. What approach do you want and what prosthesis do you want? Put right. you on the spot here, Fred. Okay. Um, When, 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 you know what the thing is that um, there is less muscle damage on a properly done anterior hip replacement. However, <laughs> sometimes you can't see everything. Posterior approaches, you have to worry about flexion, right? Hyperflexion, adduction, and internal rotation. So let's say you know sometimes if you're really weak on a on a squat and you're going down to depth, if your leg caves in. Knee then cave. you're looking to pop out. Right. That, right. On the other hand, if you go down, when you shove your knees out and you're down low, if you get external rotation, <laughs> that's when you can pop an anterior hip out. But I'm thinking to myself, I, th- I have, um, I've thought about, it. I would get a, um, personally at me, I would get a, uh, a metal with a, um, I would I would not go with a uh, ceramic ceramic head. I wouldn't go with a ceramic head. I would, I would go with just a um, who wants highly a, cross-linked polyethylene. Yeah. Yeah. And who the reason wants it's a glass hip. Listen to me. The thing about that <laughs> is that's a problem. The problem is that's perfect, right? Except right. you know what happens when you drop a ceramic cup? Right. <laughs> it breaks. And one of the things about five percent of a few years ago, this was five percent of the um, ceramics would have a little bit of a squeak, which we kind of thought was funny in the beginning. But if you're walking around and every time you take a step, you're squeaking. And the only way to fix that isn't any oil. <laughs> you have to right. do a revision of the hip replacement. Right, so I would go, I'd go with the um, a tapered femoral stem, press fit cup with a poly, with a cobalt chrome head and a, and a uh, highly cross length poly, which is basically the most common one done. Right. Now, and, in Europe, in Europe, they use ceramic more. And so I'm going to put you back in the, in, in the hot, yeah. in the hot seat here. Yeah. Posterior lateral or anterior approach? Um, for doing what I like to do now, I would, I, I'll tell you what, throw something else out. How about, um, if you could, a resurfacing and think about that. Because the thing, the difference here, this is throw a real monkey wrench into this work. If you're able to, and you're, you anatomically have the right 
um, arthritis and the right anthropom what's a you know what I mean <laughs> yeah right. anthropometry. Then a resurfacing. What, what a resurfacing did is there was a study that showed people who were like uh, higher level athletes, rock climbers, things like that, when they had resurfacing done, they felt that they were more able to go back to their their way of being that way. Okay. But I would I would uh, you know I would I would really I, I like the poster ladder because it's the most it there's not much um, people who do a lot of them don't have experience with the anterior approach. However, gives you there's much there's no requirement for any type of uh, precautions for dislocation and things like that. It basically doesn't dislocate unless you get into the real flexed and externally rotated position. You know, um, in in 25 years of emergency practice, um, I saw um, a few total hip replacement failures. Yes, um, I bet more, you did more than a few actually, where you know people just had a you know a catastrophic catastrophic failure of the product of uh -huh. not but not of the prosthesis i don't yeah. think i ever saw a prosthesis fail no every time it was a failure of the bone stock yep. every, every single time you had this beautiful prosthesis and a bone that in the interim had turned into you know sponge and right. and and the bone failed and couldn't hold the prosthesis anymore and i and i and what that tells me is to finally get off this here is that these people are on the right track. This is like a yes. really important thing to do. Yes. And um, I don't, I, I think there's a lot less resistance to this kind of thing than there used to be, but come on guys, this is, you know, this is the best way. Absolutely. I was thinking that too. You know, you have other reasons like third party wear, et cetera, like that. You get osteolysis. However, for the most part, People's oh, you can't do that because you have a joint replacement. No, you can do that with a joint replacement. You must do that. Right. You must do that with it. Right. You must do that. And that, to me, is like, there's no doubt that's how I think about this now. And I tell patients that. No doubt okay, about it. Okay, excellent. We spent some time on that, but I think it was time, <laughs> it was time well spent.